I'm Cindy Kendall. Um, I'm a senior experience designer at BML YNR. Um, I've been there for two years, plus I was an intern, um, and it was really awesome. And so today I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about um, accessibility, what it is, uh, who it applies to, why we should do it, and then kind of the ways that we can actually implement it into our design process. So um, I mentioned that I was an intern at BML YNR. Uh, I actually first became um, interested in accessibility when I was an intern. I um, realized that it actually applies to me in a way I didn't ever really realize. Um, and the way that it applies to me is actually shown by this slide. Um, this slide has three things in common that you guys might not realize, but I can't read that first number, I cannot read that clock, and I cannot do that math in my head. I have dyscalculia, which is like dyslexia, but with numbers. And so, um, if I come across a website that doesn't have like breaks in between a phone number, I can't read it and I can't make the call. I actually have to copy it, paste it, and then put in line breaks and stuff for it. We have meeting makers and I can't use the codes to get into them. I have to like, like, hang on guys, I gotta copy, paste this, put some line breaks. Okay, okay, cool, I can join the call. Thanks guys. But I actually have these struggles myself and this helped kind of push me into accessibility as an interest. So even though I'm an experienced designer, um, I've actually shifted my focus more into accessibility and how it affects the entirety of the process and everything we design. So as I said, I'll talk a lot more just about what it is and kind of theories behind it and why we should really care about it and actually uh, look into it as part of our designs. So as I said, what is accessibility? There's a lot of definitions out there for it. This one's from Techopedia. Pretty much it's just how do we make a website accessible or computer software, anything like that. And how do we make it accessible for people who may have a disability or an impairment. Um, if you're on social media, you might actually see it uh, like called A11Y, and that's to represent the number of letters between A and the Y in accessibility. It's a shorthand, it helps make, make tweets about it a lot shorter. So general definition, but still that doesn't really get into like what it actually is. So with this slide, um, take a moment to look at it. Each of these four things has something wrong with it that actually keeps it from being accessible for a certain kind of user. Um, it could be any kind of user. The fourth one's probably obvious because I already gave you guys the answer of why that wouldn't be accessible because it's not for me. Um, but just take a look at it and see like in your mind what makes this not accessible. So when looking at this, that first one's supposed to be like a link, a CTA. However, the only thing that denotes that it's a CTA is the color blue. Uh, to make things more accessible based on like the web guidelines behind it, it's actually best to have like an underline or a carrot to denote that it is a CTA for users. Especially if you think of somebody who might be colorblind and can't actually know that it's a CTA. The second one, um, it's actually hard to see on this screen itself because of the low contrast in here. You can't read it. But on the right, you can actually read it better because it meets some really good contrast ratios. Uh, the third one is a form field. However, when I'm input into this form field, I actually don't know what I'm supposed to be putting here. So if we label it, and we label it in a way that I know what it is, even when I have text in it, I'm able to know where I'm at in a form and I can go back and change information. The fourth one, it's a phone number. I can't read that one on the left because it doesn't have breaks in it. So adding in like a dash or a period would help with things like that. So knowing kind of what it is and what does it kind of look like, let's talk about who it actually affects in the world. So 15% of the world population actually lives with some form of disability. And then in the US alone, 26% um, or one in four Americans live with some sort of disability. And if you break that down even further, 13.7% um, of Americans have a mobility related disability. Uh, 5.9 have a hearing related one, and then 4.6 have a sight, and then 10.8 have a cognitive related disability. And I actually follow, fall under that with my dyscalculia. So looking at this, and when we address this kind of thing with um, disabilities and how we can help people who have them, at times you can actually help people with disabilities and people who are encountering uh, hurdles whenever you address it in your websites and even out in the real world with um, you know, a wheelchair right, or anything like that. 
So a hurdle is something that's uh, situational and usually temporary. So something like, I'm in an extremely bright space, and here we have glare on these screens, so it makes it harder to see them. Uh, you could be in an allowed environment at a bar or something, and you can't read a TV. You can't hear the TV, and so you need captions. Same thing for somebody who has partial or total deafness. Uh, they need captions as well. Um, and even to cognitive impairment or being in an emergency situation. So how do you help both sides? Well, you can, and you can actually do it by having these like this middle ground of accessible tools and resources that help both for each of these. So for colorblindness and an extremely bright space, if we meet our correct contrast ratios, if we're making sure that we're labeling things correctly, showing CTAs in more than just color, we're actually helping both. And so it's this idea of if I help those with disabilities, I'm actually helping a lot more people than I originally thought, which I personally find really cool. Um, and I'm a big fan of like helping as many people as you can when you're developing a site. So I've covered the what, um, the who, and kind of a why, but not entirely. Um, you might be taking this to a client and they're like, well, why should I care about accessibility? I mean, it's not, like, it's more, mo more money and it's a lot of work and it's a lot to think about. And they might just see it as kind of like a checklist item. Um, so you've got this aspect of, we have human-centered design that we center this around. So on a business level, uh, the simple point is you don't want to get sued. Like, there's a lot of lawsuits out there right now. Um, I know that like the Pokemon Center website, they're getting sued right now just because they don't have some alt text and it's a big lawsuit in New York at the moment. So bottom line, it saves money at the end for a business and they don't get sued. On a social aspect of it, um, you're helping people. You're doing the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people, as I said before. Uh, and I think that's very important, especially in this day and age when we think about ethics and everything like that and related to our designs. And finally, on a personal level, um, you may know somebody that this would affect. You may know somebody who has a form of disability and they can't use a website. They can't um, pay their bills regularly just because they can't use it. So tying this back into human-centered design, um, are we really user-centered if we don't focus on all of our users? And once again, one in four Americans has some form of disability just looking at the US. So with that in mind, I mentioned legal ramifications, so in that whole part of like we don't want to get sued. And with that, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Beyonce, because I love me some Beyonce. So Beyonce has a, a, a company called Parkwood Entertainment. Um, in January, I believe, she was actually sued um, because her website, um, it's just Beyonce.com, I believe, if you want to go check it out. Um, there's some cool merch. Um, I'm not sponsored by her, though. Um, anyway. <laughs> So a, uh, she was sued back in January, and she was sued by a woman who was legally blind and who cannot actually use the website. You can't tab through it correctly. I've done it myself. You could even try it out if you wanted to um, after this. And uh, she also could not purchase anything. There was no alt text on images, and she couldn't even purchase like merch or tickets. And so that's kind of a shoot in the foot to even Beyonce herself. She's not getting money out of that end, but also she's denying like basic services to somebody who any other member of the public should have access to. So she is currently being sued. It's an ongoing uh, lawsuit, but it's not the only one. As I mentioned, Pokemon Center is getting sued. I believe Nike and Adidas have also been sued as well. So I would say always be Beyonce, but if your site's not accessible, don't be Beyonce. And I'll get into how to do that a little more here in a bit. So. With this, then, um, how, do, how do we actually meet these requirements? Well, in 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, was passed, and it's just a Civil Rights Act that uh, protects the rights of those with disabilities in both uh, state and local governments, as well as public spaces and those accommodations that go with that. So I've got it applies to businesses, state, all of that here. Um, the interesting thing, though, about the Americans with Disabilities Act is that it never actually mentions it mentions web, <coughs> ever. It doesn't mention the websites, anything like that. However, uh, the Department of Justice has actually said that if it applies to public accommodations, like real physical spaces, it also applies to the web. So this is how it would affect some of your sites, um, depending on what you have. So I did mention state and local governments 
and the public, but there's also a part, part that applies to the federal sector as well. There's the Section 508, um, which applies to government agencies, federally funded nonprofits, um, and it's very similar. It follows the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines um, and the 2.0 version currently, and they're double A standards. So if this applies to any of the work that you might be doing in the future, um, I know that there are certain government sites that actually run on Drupal, which is interesting uh, to me because I found that out when kind of researching. So. Um, Section 508 is more geared toward that, and then the ADA and the WCAG are more geared towards federal, or sorry, state and government, and then um, public sector. So I brought up the uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. They're called the WCAG for short. Uh, 2.1 actually just released at the start of this year. I got really nerdy about it because it's got some cool stuff in it. Um, things like uh, interface design um, and taking like the contrast ratios just past text, but actually to like interface. So it's really cool if you want to check it out. Might be as nerdy about it as me. I don't know. I loved it. But most people still follow the 2.0. However, personally, um, on my team, I've actually pushed really hard for 2.1 because it's going to be adopted soon anyway. So WCAG actually follows this concept of P-O-U-R, or perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And these are very simple terms that actually are how they break up the guidelines themselves. And uh, with that, then, there's each of these definitions. I'm actually going to get in depth here on what each of these are and, and examples of them, so you actually know how to apply it to your designs, your work, everything. There's also um, conformance levels. I mentioned double A earlier. Um, does anybody, like how familiar are you guys with like single A, double A, triple A-ish? Yeah, okay. So single A is the most minimum basic level. If you're hitting single A, good job. I, I, approve, I approve, I appreciate it. Double A is kind of becoming the standard. I would say it's the best one. It's also the one that's required under section 508 for uh, federal government stuff. And then triple A is super intense. Um, AAA is kind of a dirty word at times, whenever you hear it, among designers especially, um, because it, everything is usually black, white, navy, which isn't super fun for my creative partners. <laughs> they really hate it, actually. Um, but you can still do it, and you can do it beautifully. There's actually a lot of sites that do, um, once they figure it out. So um, most of what I'm going to talk about today is more about the AA because I believe it's a very good standard to follow and it's the most common thing that you'll be requested or could be requested by a client. So breaking down those P-O-U-R, we've got perceivable. So it's information and user interface components that must be presentable to users in ways they can perceive. They have to be able to see it, pretty much. So uh, this even includes what they actually can't see but things with, like using a screen reader. So text alternatives. Um, all images must have captions or alt text. What I find really interesting is that Drupal 8 um, the core actually is now requiring alt text and it can only be overwritten um, by the choice of developers. So I, I like to see that they've made that step with this and are actually moving towards accessibility standards here. Um, also, time-based media. Uh, videos and audio should have a transcript provided. So ideally, if you have a video, make sure it has captions um, and everything like that. Transcripts are really great. Uh, TED Talks actually do this a lot, where they will post the video up and they'll provide a full transcript below. I think that's really awesome. Also, um, adaptable. So all content should be available, even if using other adaptive technologies. So if I'm using a screen reader, if I'm using um, some kind of like feed instead, I should still be able to, to fully enjoy a website without losing anything behind it. Some more with perceivable, and this is kind of all as one, is distinguishable. So um, limit overlap, that's a big one. It's really hard for people who have to tab through, th through things or if they're zoomed in really far to find things when they're like stacked up on top of each other. Also, um, at times whenever you zoom in really far on the site, to 200%, the site might break, or the text gets really weird, you lose things off the page. So ensuring that uh, anytime you zoom in, I think 200% is the max that you need to worry about, um, that you're not losing content and purpose and functionality. And then hover. So hover and focus, um, Easiest way to talk about this one is if you have a mega nav that you hover over, 
try to make it where it's click-based to initiate that rather than just to hover. If you think about somebody who might have Parkinson's, um, it's hard enough to like focus over those hover nabs that just you know show up on hover on a normal day, and then you can only imagine if you have Parkinson's and you had a shaky hand. So, Perceive Verbal is covered by all of those, very quick, um, but this is how I've broken them down to kind of cover those core things that are under the P section of the WCAG. Next is operable. So user interface components and navigation must be operable. So enough time. Uh, there are forms out there sometimes that say, you know, you have 30 seconds to do this form. It's not really fair to somebody who might not be able to actually uh, navigate that form faster. So uh, if you think it takes you normally five minutes, give 30 minutes. That's kind of a good rule. Seizures. So no more than three flashing images in a single second for like a, a GIF. Yes, I say it with the GIF sound because giraffe. Um, and then with GIFs or videos, anything like that, make sure you avoid flashing images more than three in a second um, just so you don't induce seizures. Kind of a big deal. Um, navigable. So provide ways for users to navigate and find content. Uh, this is kind of like creating really clear like one, two, three, four for step by steps. Um, and just making sure that you have very strong headings and H1, H2 kind of tags as well. And then provide descriptions for form fields. I brought this up earlier when I was showing examples. So if it's a zip code or anything like that, a name, label the form. Sometimes you'll even see two, and it's something we've actually used on some of my project, pro projects, excuse me, of where you'll have name inside of the form field, and then when the user clicks it, it moves above, and it's still labeled, and it works. So. And then as well with operable, you also have keyboard accessible. So this is when a screen reader can tab through completely, find all content. This was a huge problem on the Beyonce site, as I pointed out earlier. Also, uh, links, CTAs, and sections should be clearly labeled so that access slowly through a keyboard still makes sense. Um, this means avoiding links that say learn more for content. Like if you have an article that you show and you just say learn more. That's not really helpful to somebody who's using a screen reader, um, even if you have helpful like ARIA labels on it. Understandable. So this is the POU of that. Um, information and operation of user interface must be understandable. Uh, so readable and understandable. As you can see, you cannot read the one on the left there because it's orange and tiny. Um, avoiding those low contrast colors, the colors that are not friendly to users. Um, there's a lot of checkers out there that actually help you uh, decide whether or not it's a contrast, meeting those contrast ratios. Um, also, using really clear, concise uh, language is extremely important. And then, a predictable operation. So, pages should follow consistent hierarchies and standards. Really, it's things like, if I have a page about building birdhouses under plumbing, in a, like a site hierarchy, that really doesn't make sense and that doesn't help users, as well as just on-page structure. So a final thing for understandable as well is allowing users to actually avoid and correct mistakes. And this is something that's a personal pet peeve of mine um, when you don't give examples of what you expect out, out of a user. So if you expect a very specific way of putting a date in birth and you don't give it up front, um, you're going to create a lot of frustration for a user. And that's just for me as in user experience. Also, um, allowing users to edit their content and delete it if they weren't happy with it or if they noticed a mistake. And then finally, um, having a very clear um, error message. Ideally, this means not denoting it just by color, actually using like a little star by it or using text and explaining exactly what that error is. Um, and this is like kind of my pet peeve slide, but I love it and I love to preach it. It's just help people understand exactly what you want from them and then there's gonna be a lot less frustration. Uh, finally, robust. So content must be robust enough that it can be interpreted reliably by a wide variety of users, um, including their assistive technology. So if somebody's using VoiceOver on Mac or JAWS, um, they're able to still use your content and understand it and enjoy it. So that's pretty much what that first one is, is the assistive technology. And then that second one is actually, um, I know we're getting away from it, but we used to have a separate desktop versus mobile site, but now we have more responsive web. So the responsive web is actually super helpful for people who are using assistive technology as well. Um, it doesn't break and they're able to stay on the same page and it works with them if they have to zoom in or have anything else like modifying the content that you've provided them. 
So this is what the WCAG is overall, um, kind of like my take on it. And um, if you want to learn more about it, you can actually go and look up the WCAG itself. As I said, 2.1 is better. It's all of 2.0, but plus new stuff. Um, and I think it's going to be adopted really soon. Um, currently, the government follows 2.0, but trust me, 2.1 is way better. So with that, then, how do we actually take all of this, all of the, the whys, the what's, the who's, the what is it overall, and the nitty gritty details, how do we actually apply that to our work and our process? So if we look at it from this way, and we've got our understand, define, solve, those phases of our work, um, in the understand phase, we can ask ourselves, what is accessibility in regards to our project? What is accessibility in regards to our human truth? How do we, like, what do we think that is? And this is hypothetical, we can define it as we get here. In the define phase, how do we apply it? What are our achievable requirements that we can do now? And then what are our uh, kind of desirable goal requirements that we can do in three months? And defining out those things that we need to do. Also, task identification is really important as well. So is this task that I'm asking the user to do? Is it a primary task, like paying my car bill? Or is it something like changing my settings? Well, if I can't pay my car bill, and that is a primary task, we need to fix that today. Um, personas as well, so including it in our personas from the start and keeping that in mind throughout our entire process. Um, and then what's our definition of done or our success KPIs that we can even measure it by? Um, and then moving into solve, what are some ways that we can implement it? And then what's our hypothesis? I, I feel. I think that if I provide a good tab order through a site, then users can actually use my site, something like that. In the development phase, so does the development team have everything they need, they need to actually build? Do they have their requirements? Um, do they have guides, assets? Uh, do they know what they're doing with their components? And then in the iteration phase itself, we need to test with our users. We need to learn, report, analyze, and recommend. And there are a ton of tools out there to actually do this. Um, what's interesting is Schooley actually just had his talk, and he mentioned Lighthouse, which is a really good one that he actually introduced me to. And it's a really good iteration tool and even development tool as well. And I will show some other tools here in a minute. So something I have on the iteration phase is testing with users. Um, but testing with users, I think it's important to actually bring people with disabilities into the conversation. And honestly, I think they should be involved every step of the way. I know that's hard sometimes, um, just because of availability or even um, finding somebody to consult with, but I still think it's really important. Um, and so I actually have a video from Ubisoft. Uh, they did an accessible design workshop earlier this year. Um, and I think it's really cool because they were developing these games and they brought people in who it affected them deeply. They had always wanted to play these video games, but they couldn't. They had people who were deaf, who were blind, um, who maybe had some uh, mobility-related disabilities, and they were a part of the design process, part of the development, part of every part of the conversation. And I think that's extremely important to think about when we are uh, developing these sites and having these conversations about what they're going to look like. The sound's going to be a little bad, I think, because the sound overhead isn't going to be working, so I'm going to Try this. So many information was shared um, with everyone, with the other developers, with the other people with a disability, and there's no way to copy uh, a disability if you don't have, you know, your own disability because we. We uh, was born without a disability, we grew up with a disability, so the only way to find the right solution is talking with the people mm -hmm. of the disability community. So he covered some things that I think are really important. Um, we don't really know, unless we have a disability, what it's like to live with that disability. Um, and we don't really know what it's like to navigate a site without that. So I think it's important that if you can find those resources and take advantage of them in any of those steps, um, you're going to have a better site for it. So looking at it too, just with like design tools overall, um, I know that design tools are kind of interesting in that um, 
there's so many out there. There's Adobe XD that I use, or like Sketch is like what I use them as an experience designer. So there's a plugin Stark that lets me check uh, contrast ratios while I'm designing in Sketch, which is kind of really new. cool. There's even um, online checkers as well. Uh, Web AIM has one. There's another one there in the lower left. Um, there's also some neat ones that actually uh, let you simulate a disability on, in the browser. So this one is Web Disability Simulator, and I can simulate being in a bright environment. I can simulate uh, different kinds of color blindness, uh, low vision, and even to what it's like to have ADHD, I believe, and Parkinson's as well is in there. So it's a cool one. There's a lot out there like that. Um, and these are a way to simulate it if you can't actually get somebody in the room with you. Also with this is there's some different developer tools. So there's um, WAVE, which is the Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool. That's the big one on the left there. Um, I can run an audit on a site, and then it will actually come back with, it has these contrast ratios, it's missing this alt text, um, and it has all these issues with it. And you can actually look at it, it will reference WCAG's guides and tell you what levels you can even filter by. I want to filter by single A, double A, triple A, and it will actually report that back to you as well. There's also some really great sites, and I do have all of these tools in the appendix as well, if you would like them, and a lot more. Um, but the um, A11Y style guide um, is really great. It's got some really good examples of how to build accessible components that work for you and work for your site. A lot of really good information and a good community there. And then also there's Lighthouse, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Schooly showed it um, in his, but it's a way to actually run an accessi accessibility audit from the Google Chrome uh, Dev Tools, and it's pretty neat. It's cool. It comes back with a score, and it tells you what you need to work on, but it still doesn't fully encapsulate like actually looking at the site and figuring out what's wrong. So with all of these tools, um, I think it's just really important to think about how do we integrate these into what we have? And a lot of times, a client might come to you and say, I want an accessible site. And then we can turn around and say, okay, well, we can do these things. Check, 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 check. I'm a big, um, I'm a big believer in the idea that accessibility isn't a checklist, and it's not something you just check off, and you're like, okay, cool, I'm done. I did it. We're good. Um, I fully believe that um, it's not a stop on the way to your destination. Um, accessibility is the car you're driving in, the road you're driving on, stops along the way, and it's your destination. So, thank you. Are there any questions? Um, so, mine's more on the comments since I work for the government. Mm -hmm. I have not. Is it really good? Um, so if you, can you put it up right now? Yeah, I can try. I actually want to show everyone this because probably no one knows this. Okay, just say 